love so much. That memory never leaves us quickly. But this is a real thing that really happened to our Lord and Savior because of you and I. He died on the cross so that we don't have to die on the cross. That's why we are here tonight. He took away our sins. He delivered us from death. He delivered us from sickness, disease. So as you come before the presence of the Lord, think about these things. Think about the sacrifice Jesus has made for you and I. Would you rise up and join us and worship the Father this night?
Just keep your eyes closed and just imagine with me for a second. Just imagine. Imagine you do a big mistake, you know. Sometimes if you drive, if you do a mistake, you go over the speed limit, you have to pay for your transgression. And some of our fines are expensive and they're a lot. And then you feel like, how am I going to pay this? And then imagine someone pays and takes it all, whatever price it is, whatever it is. It's not that... The ticket is now gone. Come on. Is that somebody took on the price and the penalty that you were supposed to take on. Come on. So now you are able to use your vehicle and drive just because someone else paid. Come on. Bring it back to the cross and bring it back to Jesus. You know, we sing this song often because he leaves, I can face tomorrow. And all we can think is our plans, what we want, and what we are expecting for the future. But we do not have to forget that it's because he lived and died that we have even a life to worry about. You see, it's because Jesus lives that I have a job to get worried about. It's because he lives that I have a wife or, or a husband or friends that stress me. It's because he lived and died. It's because he decided to take a prize and a penalty for what I fully deserved. That is why I live. That is what gives us worth. That is what bought us back from the price of the pain. A life is worth because he lived. Just meditate on that. Because he lived. Because he lived. A life is worth
Yeah. 
Just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. And go to that hill far away. Just go to that hill. Where Jesus stood in between two criminals. And just before we get ready for the communion, I just want to highlight to you the difference between the two criminals. Mm. One asked for salvation. One asked for salvation without fear of God. He was mocking God, save me, do this, do some, this and that. And the other one rebukes him, saying, telling him, do you not fear God? And I feel like sometimes we are, we are so ready, we are so excited for what the resurrection power God does and the blood of Jesus being spilled. But we forget that this blood was spilled for us to get the fear of God resurrected in us. For us to reverence God. You see, in the Bible, Joseph was able to fight temptation because he said, I cannot do this to the Lord my God. David said, I can't offer to God something that costs me nothing. There is a power that comes from understanding the fear of God. There is a reference of God that we need to rediscover. There is a king that shed precious blood. And sometimes we need to go back and cry for cleansing of our sins. Knowing that we cannot buy our salvation. And it's the fear of God that helps us to work for this salvation. Before anything else, close your eyes and ask God, God, revive the fear of you in me. Revive your fear. Revive your reverence of you in me. So that I can work in this salvation that you've got for me. Lord, help me. Revive that fear. I don't want to be like the other criminal. Asking for salvation without fear. Lord, I know you're my salvation cost something, so help me to work it in fear of you, in reverence of you, beholding your holiness. Though I'll cherish thee, oh, rock and crown. just come and just walk the street of this world and die and go back to heaven. 
he was flawed. He was chastised by men. He was disgraced and shamed. He was part of all because of the love that he has for humanity. All because he wants to reconnect man with their maker God. He carried the cross by himself. The cross that he was nailed on. We are doing this today to remember all that he has done for us. Today is different remembrance of for whom God was, what Jesus did. Let us take this communion today with a special understanding that he went through what he went through because he loves us. And we are responding today for not taking that love for granted. Before we pray, I'm going to read the book of Luke 22, verse 20. It says, Then after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is my new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Father, tonight we just thank you, Lord, for your blood that you shed for us. Lord. Lord, we thank you for this wine, Lord, representing your blood. We thank you for the new covenant, Lord, Father, that you have established between you and us, O oh Father. Lord, we pray, Father, tonight as we take of this wine, Lord, that our covenant with you would be renewed every day in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, that we pray tonight, O oh Lord, that everyone, O oh Lord, that partake of this wine tonight, Lord, Father, that they will connect, stay connected with you forever and ever until you come in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you all the praise tonight. We bless your holy name in Jesus' name. to take our communion.
Father Lord, we just thank you today. As we have partake of your body and your blood. Obeying your word that says that we should do this in remembrance of you. Lord, oh God, we declare tonight that anything that is not of you, oh God, in our lives, flush them out, oh Lord, from the inside and cleanse us from all impurity and make us worthy by your blood. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we have the ladies with the seven words come up? You may be seated, please. wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastening of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Okay, Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 to 27. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my blood, 27. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. My reading is taken from the book of Matthew 26, 28 to 29. It says, For this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The fourth scripture of this day comes from Luke 9, from 
verses 21 to 22. Jesus says, Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The son of man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Amen. Now we're taking the fifth scripture, Luke 23, from verse 33 to 34, and it says, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right, and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. John 19, 28. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. My reading is taken from Luke 24, 6 to 7. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Amen. Please can all the women in the house please come up to the stage.
Amen. Um, we are going to hear um, the word from uh, Sister Kwame. Okay. He was destined to be the Messiah, a scepter, a ruler. It was prophesied by Isaiah. Chosen by love before creation, he'd bring justice to the nation. From a virgin maiden, a lowly son born in a manger. The government would be upon his shoulders, wonderful counselor, mighty one, prince of peace, and his kingdom would continue to increase. the time did come the Messiah yes the one that they prayed and waited for preaching good news to the poor and the acceptable year of the Lord the sick he healed the captives he freed the oppressed he gave liberty He cast out demons with just one word. He even raised the dead. Yet, they crucified him. The winds and waves obeyed him. Yet that man still betrayed him. And they crucified him. After all the prophecies, and all the testimonies, their hardened hearts only burned with conspiracies. And they crucified him. Palm branches were waving, clothes thrown on the ground. Hosanna, Hosanna! The king would triumphantly wear his crown, right? crucified him but it was not in vain that he died and it was not in vain that he cried Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani he did it all for me despised, rejected, crushed for my iniquities, stricken, smitten. He took my infirmities, beaten, wounded. He healed all my disease, oppressed and afflicted. Yet he held his peace. So I could be redeemed. Like an unblemished lamb to the slaughter, the cross became the altar, and there my king bled. The twisted, thorny crown piercing his head. And there he died. It is finished, he cried. Then he rose, he'd paid the price. No other lamb was a worthy propitiation. No other blood could buy my salvation. None other could suffice. Jesus.
Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many.
when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Amen. Can we put our hands together for Jesus? That was not the kind of hand. I know we are sad from what's happened, but we can do better. Each time you hear anything about the name of Jesus, I would like to have a people that are excited. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Father, we thank you for a time like this. We thank you that we can take out a time of the year where we can sit together and reflect on what you have done. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us. Thank you for reminding us of the finished work on the cross. And we are asking that you help us as we walk through this path. That your name will be glorified through our lives. That we shall not do this as a routine or as a religious act that we get to do once in a year. But that we will have some time to reflect on the price that you paid. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I am not going to preach uh, tonight. It's, I'm just going to get us a place of reflection. Reflection. And I did not come here with um, any revelation concerning the Good Friday or the death on the cross. I'm just going to share what, uh, what I've been doing, what has been happening in my spirit this season as we went through the Lent period and uh, the reflections that I've had and I put into writing. And I'm going to ask you to, to do the same. So don't sit to listen to a sermon because it is not a sermon. It is reflections. And I would like you to follow me through and do the same. Do the same. Amen. This uh, Good Friday is big. It's big for us in Fola. For those of you that are new, you can notice that the women... Uh, did everything here. It's, the, it's our culture because our pastor from the time we were called into the ministry has followed the scriptures and because of what happened on the crucifixion, there was just the women that stood by Jesus all through when he went to the cross. They were the people that stayed there. So he uh, taught us to practice the same thing that happened. Because usually, we know in many ministries, women are Sunday school teachers, uh, keyboard players. Uh, they clean the church. And, um, and that's all. They, they serve the communion sometimes. But then uh, many churches don't even allow them to minister. But our assignment is no male, no female. It's about the call of God upon the body as a whole. We are together, we we'll put hands together, read the word, and serve the Lord as you have been gifted. Each person as you have been given. Amen. 
So today, I just want us to appreciate the Women of Destiny for getting together to do this production. And on Sunday, we are going to continue. So please, we ask you to join us. You're, if you're not a female. No. She said, no male, no female. There is male, there is female. We we'll get that clear. Amen. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, we know what I'm saying, okay, yes. But I know the world we are living now, we have to be clear. Yeah, yeah because someone might quote me now and say, that pastor said this. So thank you, Apostle. That's why you're here, to bring us back. So it's uh, reflections on the perfect sacrifice on the cross. Uh, that scripture from Isaiah 53, verse 10. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Amen. You know, the one that caught me there was, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. How would that be like for you, even as a father, or as a parent, it will please you to bruise your child? This is not a normal kind of love that God has for us. It's an abnormal kind of love. So this is the, the, my, my reflection scripture started from that. Then the main uh, scriptures that I'm going to work on is 20, Matthew 27 from uh, 45 to 54. Matthew 27, 45 to 54. We're not going to be, uh, read it the way it is. I'm just calling our attention to where I'm going to be speaking from my reflections that I'll be sharing. You know, um, we know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus physically left this world. and uh, But he left a, a movement. And that movement has continued, and it will continue from generation to generation until he comes back. Can I have an amen in the house? Hallelujah. But there's something about this movement of Jesus, and the symbol he left is not the cradle or the manger. That's not the symbol he left, and it's not even the crown. When you think of famous people, when they die, they will leave all these, uh, they will call them their, their what, and you call the billions of dollars that they left. Or some of them will leave all these uh, museums, some things that you go to see in the museum. They will build huge things or factories that you go to visit. But the symbol that I reflected on that of Jesus is the cross. Like, it's not even an expensive thing. Like, the cross, why the cross? Why is it not gold or diamond or big cars like Hammer Jeep? I like that car because it's really big. <laughs> because I, I realize that when you're driving a small car, the other big, big cars don't respect you. But if you just carry the big one and when they see you, they, they can let you go, yeah? So, like, it was not, why would it be just this old, rugged cross that was the symbol that Jesus left for us? And, and it was something, as we know, according to the history, that was a very, very shameful symbol according to the time that Jesus lived on. 
and is uh, very cruel where when people committed the crime, they will stay there and the others will come and mock them and spit on them and tell them bad words because that's where criminals are killed. But Jesus we, we left the cross for us as a symbol of remembrance unto him. And this cross is so powerful that even the occult world, they will turn it the opposite way. They want to use it as well because there is power on what Jesus did on the cross. And it's, it's, for me, it's, it's really deep. When I, during this reflection, the, the, the cross became something else. When you go around and you look in the jewelry stores, you will see cross. Even non-believers want to wear the cross. It's used on clothing, on different things. You will see the cross is being represented there. That's something that I would like you to, to reflect on when you go home or in this period. And then we know that he spoke so, uh, seven words on the cross, uh, which uh, I'm not going to deal with this evening. But there are a few of them that I would like us to talk about when he, he spoke about his father. When he called, uh, he said to God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, I would be thinking that when you are in such pain, when you have been hurt so much, that you will be cursing the people. Let, let's be honest, there's somebody, you didn't do anything, these people came, you have been helping these people. And now they came, they are flogging you, they've lied on you, they are spitting on you, and now you're saying to forgive them? That doesn't look normal to me either. That was another strong reflection that I had. And then I look at him, he called our attention to parents. He spoke to his father. And then he also spoke about his mother. Whereby he, he said, uh, when he said, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And then at that point, who, like the, the John was not the, the son of Jesus, he was not the son of Mary. Then I wondered, what about the brothers of Jesus at that time? Why, how come he did not, Jesus did not talk about his, his brothers? Then I, I realized that, you know, Mary was a widow at that time, maybe, because we didn't hear about Jesus again. And she must have been old a little bit uh, senior. And according to the, the Bible, John 7, 5, John 7, 5, we can see that Jesus, his brothers were not saved, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So the, the, his brothers were not saved until after the resurrection. So there's no way... Jesus would have confided in his brother to trust his mother into their hands. Maybe when this woman might start praying in tongues, the brothers might throw, throw her out of the house. So according to their culture, Jesus also, uh, being the first son of Mary, had to take a responsibility, making sure that the mother was okay in his absence. So he entrusted Mary to uh, a good guy that was John. And he stayed with John 
until, and then we can see that in the book of Acts. Also, something else that I reflected on, on, on the crucifixion, the brothers of Jesus were not there anyway. They did not go to the cross. But John was there. So he looked down and he saw the pain and the mother's face. And he said, who am I going to ask to take care of this woman? Let me talk to my trusted friend. So he showed care. At that time, Jesus was not thinking about himself, despite the pain he was going through. He was thinking about us when he asked the Father to forgive us. And then he thought about his mom and asked somebody to take care of them as the oldest son in the family. And Mary was there until the book, I think it's Acts chapter 1 from 12 to 14. Um, another thing that I, I reflected on as well in this period was when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, that uh, you already brought out during the worship today. And that was his, his last convert. Even at that time on the cross, Jesus was, make, was still in the ministry of salvation. He was still trying to save even the last person that will come to him. But we should also know that that thief, as we heard the message, also asked Jesus to remember him in paradise. And Jesus said, yes, today you will be with me in paradise. So often when we lose our loved ones, we want to cover it up by saying they've, been, they've gone to be with the Lord. That is a huge reflection for me. And some people will always say, you don't know what happened before they died. But the Bible says here that the, the, the other thief was cursing Jesus, but this one openly admitted that Jesus was Lord. And his salvation was public. So I would like to encourage you as you reflect. If you know somebody, your friend or family that does not know the Lord, start talking to them about Jesus now. Don't make posters for them when they die and say they have gone to be with the Lord. That means that we are saying there will be no hell. Because every post that I've seen says, gone to be with the Lord, or transcended in glory. Are we trying to say that the Bible is not true? Let's do this work the way Jesus did it, while people are still here on earth. So that was uh, another reflection that I had. So as he was just hanging on that cross, he was still paying attention to who, who is it that can be saved even today at this moment before I give my last breath, who can, who can be saved? So I would like you when you go to work or something, to be praying and saying, who can be saved? Who can receive Jesus in my workplace today? Who can receive Jesus when I go to the grocery store today? And uh, another reflection I had was also when Jesus called uh, the Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's unusual. For Jesus it has always been father. It has always been father. But then it tells me that at that time, when the sin of the world came on his shoulder, 
Jesus was, Jesus became sinful because of the sins of man. And becoming sinful, he was now detached from his father. But Jesus cried out and said, my God, my God. But sometimes I realize that when we get into trouble and we get into very heavy situations, we get mad at God. We get mad at God. We don't want to call him. I've seen people that when they are struggling, when you want to talk to them about God, say, don't talk to me about God at this time. But Jesus actually called upon him. He was struggling. He was sinless. He was in pain. He has been accused. Yet he was the only innocent person in this whole picture. But then he called unto God and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Something else that stood up for me in, uh, as I was reflecting was the darkness. And that is uh, 27, uh, verse 47, verse 45 from the Matthew 27. Verse 45, we can read that one. And it says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then I thought about darkness. I thought about darkness. You know, uh, there were times that we used to travel a lot. And so we are in this place at this time and then we're in this and the other place. So in the middle of maybe one nation or like that, I'll get confused in one hotel room and I want to go to the washroom. It's dark. I don't know where I am. And I'll ask him, where are I ask the person, where are we? Where are we? So what's going on? I, I can't find my way. I, I don't know. Where where am I at this time? Everything is dark. I feel lost. I'd like you to think about the darkness that covered the earth at that time when Jesus was crucified. That was another thing that stood up to me. Darkness is very terrible. And I also like you to think about it too. It can be in your house, there's no light, and you just hit your feet. I don't know how they say it in Italian, we say in champale, we say in champata. So how do they say it? Trip, okay. And you tripped on something in your own house because everything was dark. But you know what? I realized that this darkness was a representative of sin and a life without God. A life without God is dark. And it's, you, you, you don't know where you're going. It brings confusion. You get into trouble. But then light is a picture of life filled with godliness. And it's somehow too, you can see that as far back as Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. Genesis at the beginning said that God said, let there be light. And there was light. So at that time, there was darkness already. So nothing was working because of darkness. So the moment Jesus was on the cross and then darkness covered the earth again, darkness came over the earth. But then we know what the, 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 the scripture tells me here and it says that uh, Jesus is a light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. Also says, and Jesus himself says of himself, I am the light of the world. So when he was crucified, darkness covered the earth because the light of the world had taken over the sin that he did not commit. 
soon. The only light of the world became sinful just so we can receive salvation. Psalms 27, verse 1. This is King David himself that was saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. And uh, Isaiah also said that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. So these are the things that were prophesied before Jesus came. He was, has always been declared as light. There, there's something else as well here that I, I reflected on as, as I'm closing is the desertion. I think that was the greatest agony on the cross. Not really the, the strokes or the, the spikes, you know how they put the spears to check if he was dead, but it was the separation. When sin covered Jesus, and Jesus first separated from the Father, that was the greatest agony. At this point, I just want to invite us to just rise up on our feet with me. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. I would just like us to just close our eyes and do our own reflection. I just shared mine. Do our own reflection. This perfect prize of the cross. Is there someone in your family that doesn't know Jesus? Is there someone in your workplace that doesn't know Jesus? Have you prayed for this person sincerely from your heart? Have you thought about the life of this guy? Will you consider taking out some time to pray sincerely for these people to know Jesus? Will you consider taking out time and being honest about anybody that God will bring your way as you pray for yourself for the blessing of the day that you will add it to your prayer list and say, Lord, anybody that will come my way today, let them meet you. Can you make that type of reflection? Because this is the only thing that is going to matter at the end of the day. The movement that Jesus started is symbolized by the cross. And this cross costs so much. And he said he doesn't want anybody to perish. But that all will be saved. Father, I thank you that we didn't have to go through this. You did it for us. We didn't even ask you. Lord, we didn't even pray for our own salvation. But you saved us because of your love. Lord, we want to lift up our families that don't know you. We want to lift up our friends that don't know you. We want to lift up this land of Canada. Lord, we want to lift up this land and we are calling, let the rain of salvation come over this land and let souls begin to come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we want to plead the blood of Jesus over the hearts of those that are saved, the believers that have been saved, but they are falling astray due to the things of this world. Lord, we pray for them and we put a seal over their souls and we say, Lord, restore. 
restore, restore, restore the ministers that have fallen astray. Restore your servants, restore the body, those that have missed it, oh Lord. We are calling on to you to restore. And your name, your name alone be glorified. In your name we have prayed. Amen. So I'll cherish the aura, get out till my truth, till my truth is at last I lay down. I will cling, I will cling to. Cherish, so I'll cherish the whole until my truth is at last. I'll 